The crushing brutality of the cross gave way to dumbfounding bewilderment. Jesus was dead. Then, three days later, he showed up. After Jesus ascended, the Holy Spirit poured out on the early church and began his journey across the oceans and across the millennia to collide with you as you sit in this room today. The gospel crossed mountains, the gospel crossed cultures, the gospel crossed hills, valleys, and what you do when you leave this theater carries the story further. The book of Acts began on the other side of the mountains to our east. It continues in your heart, and its next chapter begins on the sidewalk outside. This is the book of Acts. Are you excited to hear from this incredible book today? I am too. We've studied the gospel of John verse by verse, and we've seen lives changed by it. It's been incredible to behold, but the story continues. We've studied the resurrection of Jesus and his restoration of Peter on the beach by the charcoal fire. It was by a charcoal fire that Peter first denied Jesus. It was by a charcoal fire that Jesus restored Peter to ministry. This broken, messed up dude who often put his foot in his mouth was used by God to get up and address a crowd of thousands of people and the church was launched into the New Testament era. We only have guys like Peter. We only have people like Thomas. These are the only ministers of the gospel that we have. We only have imperfect people. We had one perfect guy and we crucified him. So here's what we're left with. As he has ascended in the beginning of the book of Acts, we have people like Peter who are used by the Holy Spirit to accomplish things whose sum is far beyond the means of the human instruments who hold this power in earthen vessels that are easily shattered to show that this power is from God and it's not from us. We've seen enough bumbling moments from Peter to know that he was, he was not an eloquent one. He was not an anointed communicator, but he got up and he proclaimed Joel chapter two to a massive crowd at Pentecost. I'm going to give a quick survey of the opening chapters of Acts if you're not familiar with it. I have already taught through the first nine chapters, and there's a resource on a website that's available for free for members of the Redemption Church. If you go to jessecampbellministries.com and go to resources and click on origins from the birth of the New Testament church to you and use the coupon code ACTS, all of those writings and resources will be completely free for you. This website exists so that we may get help from those who hear our sermons on the radio to alleviate personnel budget responsibilities from the Redemption Church and add to a fund to get this purchase a building. So this is 100% free for members of the Redemption Church. We don't charge admission. <laughs> this is just something that is published already, but it's free for you because I know the guy who wrote it. This is the book of Acts. It's called this because these are the acts of the apostles. Who are the apostles? Good question, Gary. The disciples were commissioned by Jesus to go. And this makes them the sent out ones. It's what the word apostle means. They the sent out ones. They needed an even 12. The numerology of, of 12 was significant. From God's sovereign election of the 12 tribes of Israel, named for the 12 sons of the patriarchs, these, these 12 tribes were chosen by God in the same way these 12 disciples were chosen by God. Jesus looked at them and said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And in John 17, he prays for them, even Judas, who would betray him in a fulfillment of prophecy. And then as Judas ends his life in deep sorrow, moving on from there, the 11 choose Matthias through the final use of the casting of lots as recorded in scripture so that they would not be the 11, but the 12. Matthias had always been there from the baptism on, and so he brought them back to an even number 12. And so the 12 chosen ones now are sent out, and Jesus' prayer that not only these would be looked after, but also everyone who believes because of their message. Does anybody in the room, if you're a Christian and you believe because of the message, would you raise your hand? That's us, that's you, that Jesus prayed for you in John chapter 17. I'm so glad that he chose John because it was by John's gospel that I believed and was saved at six years old, April 16th, 1991. This is what happens next. In Acts chapter one, 
Jesus speaks. There are red letters in the first chapter of Acts. A lot of people don't know that. When you think about red letter text, you just think about the gospels, right? Traditionally, Bible publishers, this was not in the original Greek. Truth be told, it's not even, it's not even in, true to the original intent of the manuscripts. It's just a study tool for clarification for us. When Jesus would speak, the words are printed in red so as to distinguish them. Now, all of it is inspired, okay? The book of Habakkuk is just as inspired by the Holy Spirit of God as were the red letter texts of the Gospels and the opening of the book of Acts. This is also why you'll sometimes see red letters appear in Revelation, because the resurrected Jesus, looking like a lamb who is alive, though he has been slain, bearing upon himself the wounds that cost God the atonement forever, speaks. And so the letters are red. Traditionally, there are red letters as well in the opening of the book of Acts. Jesus didn't just die at the end of the Gospels. He resurrected, and he appeared to people, and he spoke again. And so he, he has more to say in the opening of the book of Acts. For context, this was written by Luke. Luke was not one of the 12 disciples, but he was a very thorough, well-researched, highly educated physician and historian. And this more than qualified him. God used his gifts of, of intelligence and, and eloquence to record the memoirs of Peter and using as a source text the other gospels for alignment. Luke wrote the gospel of Luke as a letter to a man named Theophilus. He wrote another letter to Theophilus, and that's the book of Acts. So here are the opening words of this book. I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So Luke takes on what could be regarded in modern terms. Forgive me if I sound like a Star Wars geek to you, my skeptical friend, for just a moment. You, you know, if you're not really into Star Wars and you hear people arguing about Star Wars, that's probably how my skeptical friends are going to feel right now. So give me just a minute. <laughs> Within Christianity, there are these two basic schools of apologetics, evidentialist apologetics and presuppositional apologetics. The two are not as opposed as one may think, especially not as much as the presuppositionalists tend to think. I've been used by God to lead several militant atheists to Christ. And usually they come to Christ because of the presuppositional method, if you have to choose one method or the other. But the evidentialist approach leads people to Christ every day. Ken Ham's Creation Museum, I've been to it. It's cool. It's kind of like cheesy, you know, Chuck E. Cheese puppetry or whatever, but that's because it was low budget. <laughs> but the message is clear in the gospel. I've been to the Ark Encounter as well. There are speculative proto-species all over the place, but he has a sign that says, we don't actually know if this is what they look like. <laughs> But the gospel is evident. You can't leave the big giant boat without walking through a big giant living life-size comic strip that shares the gospel. And there's a massive door on the ark with a cross illuminated on it to show that in the same way that the ark was the way to salvation for people in Noah's day, Jesus is the way to salvation for people in our day. I do not disparage anyone who employs the evidentialist apologetic, even though I tend to favor the presuppositional. Star Wars rant over. This, however, was an evidentialist proof. He's speaking to Theophilus about many convincing proofs. So when you look at something that is evidence-based and say, see, look at that, that's evidence that the Bible is true. That's evidence that the Bible's historicity is impeccable. That's evidence that the Bible is archeologically ahead of us. That's evidence when you look at the number of supernovae that we have observed and think about the age of the universe, for example, we're missing several hundred million supernovae. And you're like, wait a minute, that should be higher. That number should be higher. How old is the universe? This is, for example, an evidentialist-based proof. Now, these are often the proofs that don't get me anywhere with militant skeptics. I have to share that with you. There are very few skeptics who have come to Christ because of, at least maybe it's because I'm lousy at the, at the approach. It could be. 
But in my experience, most of the atheists that I've led to Christ have come to Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit as I share with them the gospel, and then they see it as the paradigm they've always been seeking, the basis, the logos, the origin, the authoritative rubric by which they understand truth from fiction, right from wrong, and good from evil, which to the very marrow of their bones they know. They know is not an evolutionary adaptive trait, a herd instinct lending itself to more fitness unto survival. Rather, they know that it is is transcendent. It's authoritative. It has an arbiter and an author to whom we will all answer. And this is how I personally, in my own personal evangelistic walk, I've seen more people come to Christ. However, Ken Ham has led a whole lot more people to Christ than I have. And it's to his credit that he is actually imitating Luke's Holy Spirit-inspired approach in a letter to a man named Theophilus. This is where Jesus speaks in the opening of the book. While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which, he said, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. This is powerful. Jesus just spoke. How cool is that? We've read about his crucifixion in the last book, and now he's speaking in this book. Take a moment, because that's awesome. Now let's look at what he said. Because if you misunderstand what he just said, and you take up a militant cause and plant your flag on the wrong side of an interpretation, you could follow the same fallacious tracks of those who have started false denominations because of a misinterpretation of these very words. But it's a very understandable interpretation because he did just say, John baptized you with water, but I will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit in the coming days, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then he tells them that they will receive power from the Holy Spirit when he comes upon them, that they will be his witnesses in Jerusalem, right there where they're speaking, Judea, that's the larger region, Samaria, they just had to cross cultural lines to do that, and to the ends of the earth, you know, where we currently are. (laughs) It's kind of cool that you read a prophecy that this message is going to reach the other side of the world from the other side of the world. Evidently, it's true. Evidently, it's true. They were his witnesses all the way to Washington State before Washington State even existed as Washington State. We can all trace our origins as Christians back to the events of the book of Acts. Everyone who's ever been led to Christ eventually can trace their spiritual ancestry back to these events. Someone led you to Christ. Who led that person to Christ? Who led the person to Christ? Who led you to Christ? Who led to Christ? The person who led to Christ. The person who led to Christ. The person who led you to Christ. Who then led to Christ? The person who led to Christ. The person who led to Christ. The person who led to Christ. The person who led you to Christ. You see, we could do this all day. And I'll answer it for you. Ultimately, ultimately, it comes back to Jesus himself. All of us can trace our spiritual ancestry. And something, this is really cool. Okay, I guarantee you, my patriotism is bigger than yours, but this transcends nations, doesn't it? This is an ancestry that is more, it means infinitely more to me than my own ethnicity. This is something that is eternal. This is something that transcends every culture ever. It's what transcends all cultural distinctives. It's what transcends every nation's history. You realize our nation's not even 300 years old yet. This happened 2,000 years ago. I mean, zoom out and consider the scope of the gospel and how far it came, not just geographically, but through cultural barriers and war, destitution, difficulty, poverty, famine, plague. It transcends political landscapes. It has outlived every one of its critics for thousands of years. Moreover, I believe that the greatness of the nation that we call home is attributed in part to the gospel. No, I do not believe that we're a theocracy, and no, I'm not going to make it a law, my skeptical friend, that says that you have to convert today or you get a ticket. Rather, This whole nation was built on a novel idea, something that only could have come about by the gospel. The whole nation begins with a statement of God, that our rights are not granted to us by a despot on a throne, but you were born with rights, given to you, 
by your creator, rights that no one can take away from you. There's no other constitution in the world that begins on a theological argument like that. So our very founding is predicated upon the truthfulness of this book. This is our ancestry. In the events that unfold and the chapters that we study, what will seem like mundane geographic details, Paul and Silas traveled north and tried to turn northward into Bithynia, but the Numa Agiu, the Holy Spirit, forbade them from doing so. And so they continued west, and they tried to turn northward into Asia. But then the Spirit of Jesus, the Greek says, Numa Yesu. I don't know what that means, but I love it. Said no. Think about that. Like, we're going to go share the gospel. And Jesus said no. <laughs> and they keep going in Acts chapter 16. As a result, they move west. They get a vision of a man in Macedonia named for Philip of Macedon, father of Alexander the Great, a port city that's heavily influential near Philippi. The gospel continues to radiate out geographically from there. Eight chapters prior, it's already entered Ethiopia. From here, Macedonia will become the southeastern corner of a burgeoning new country in the centuries to come called Europe. Europe will be the cradle for the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church would go awry in multiple ways. Not 100%. There's still some true believers in the Catholic Church. I have dear friends who adhere to it. But man, there's some error there. And some of those roots grow pretty deep. Some of them even contributing to the impetus behind which the Puritans themselves crossed the ocean into the new world, as they called it, to practice Christianity freely in a new place. These colonies would become independent, waging war with their founding country. Upon staking claim to this land, the new world, they would move west. Lewis and Clark would pioneer a new trail befriending Native Americans en route. As they did, they discovered the Pacific right here near the Cascade Mountains, the Olympic Mountains. This would become Washington State and a development on the shore named after the chief of the Indian tribe nearby. Seattle would become a chief port city attracting in the centuries to come and attracting in the decades to come businesses from all over the world and would soon become one of the hubs of the biggest businesses ever. And at some point, that brought you here. And then God started this thing called the Redemption Church that began in the AMC Theater in Factoria. We can all trace our spiritual lineage back to the events of this book. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. I understand why, I perfectly understand why it's a common interpretation, particularly among charismatic churches, to say you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Jesus told them you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You're going to receive power. My Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then when you see the Holy Spirit pour out in Acts chapter 2, everybody begins to speak in tongues. And so you would say, okay, that's what baptism of the Holy Spirit means. But there's more to the book. There are multiple outpourings of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. And the minority of them involve speaking in tongues. And two of them that involve speaking in tongues serve very direct pragmatic purposes. I'll show you. Remember what Jesus said in Acts 1.8, because that prophecy that we're currently sitting in the fulfillment of, literally right now, will also come up as I build the bridge to the text that we're going to pick up in our small group curriculum this week. By the way, there's a code there. There's a link there to take you straight to the free resources that I've already written on the opening chapters of Acts. Jesus said, it is not for you to know the time or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This in response to a question committing the classic metaphysical error of Orthodox Judaism, wherein the disciples asked, are you gonna restore the kingdom to, to, to Israel now? Are you going to oust these Roman occupiers so that we can finally have our autonomy and independence once more? And Jesus' answer should be humbling for all of us. They committed the classic metaphysical error in that they believed that all the messianic prophecies were really about the political interests of Israel alone. God has special plans for the nation of Israel. God has more planned for Israel. God loves his chosen nation. And you're going to see a massive revival in Israel as the events of Revelation 12 unfold. But from its inception, 
the very covenant that God made with Abraham that became the seed from whence the nation of Israel was miraculously born was to bless all nations. God said this over and over again to Abraham in Genesis 12 and 15 and 17 and 22. In every iteration of the promise, whether he would mix the metaphor or not from the number of stars in the sky, the sand on the seashore, the promise was not just for Abraham's own sake. It was to bless all nations. And now, upon his resurrection, the disciples immediately asked for the political interests of Israel to be met. They didn't actually like what Jesus had to say about the political future of Israel at that time. In Matthew chapter 24, looking at the temple, he said, not one stone will be left unturned on this temple, but I will rebuild it in three days. And they scoffed at him, not knowing that he was speaking about the very resurrected body from which he speaks in this text. But his prophecy came absolutely true in the year AD 70, when the tensions between the Jewish leaders and the Roman occupiers would hit a fever pitch. And convinced that there was gold within the walls, the Roman centurions would dismantle the temple brick by brick. I've seen one of the stones at the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. And so Jesus' prophecy came true, came realized, at least in part. I believe it also carries apocalyptic connotations. But they dismantled the temple, and indeed not one stone was left unturned. This precious place where Jewish worship took, the, where, where Jewish worship was hosted, this, this temple whose foundations were given to Solomon by God, build it here. This was where Old Testament life took place. This was like the purpose of the Exodus. They set up the tabernacle traveling across the Exodus sands as an imitation without realizing it of the throne room of God, by the way. And then arriving in Jerusalem, building this temple to the exact specifications laid out by God in the Torah. This is where the Holy of Holies was. This is where the presence of God was. At the very middle of the very middle of the very middle of the temple in Jerusalem. The middle of Jerusalem. In the middle of the middle of the Middle East, as we call it, was God on the earth. The Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept where the high priest would sprinkle the blood of a bull once a year to atone not only for his own sin, but also for the sins of the nation. The author of Hebrews would use the office of high priest as an example to show that Jesus is forever a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We'll talk more about Melchizedek when we get to Samaria. And he, this high priest, would have to atone for his own sins first. And he'd have to come back over and over again year after year to do it. Jesus then is a far superior high priest because he didn't have personal sin and he didn't have to go in year after year. He didn't have to go in and make sacrifices. He made one sacrifice for all time. Do you see now the significance of the curtain tearing the moment that Jesus died on the cross? It's because the direct presence of God on the earth was no longer in the center of the center of the center of the temple at the center of Jerusalem. Now, because of the Holy Spirit, the direct dwelling of God is right here. And so Old Testament worship then became obsolete and Jesus' discussion with the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter four suddenly takes on a whole new scope. A time is coming when people will neither worship God the Father in Jerusalem or here on this mountain in Samaria. You see, Abraham built an altar in Samaria and he made a tithe offering to a man named Melchizedek who was serving in a priestly office of sorts. And there they said, this is where Old Testament worship takes place. They disregarded the remainder of the law of Moses. They disregarded the rest of the story. Truth be told, the Samaritans were incorrect in their theology, but it didn't matter, Jesus said. A time is coming when you don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship God. You don't have to come to this mountain to worship God. There's a time coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And these are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. This is New Testament worship. This is New Testament worship. Hence Paul's words in Romans 12. This is your spiritual act of worship. It's no longer a physical set of ceremonies and laws by which you abide. God has fulfilled the sacrificial law through Christ's sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection guarantees our inheritance and a resurrection that we share with him. This is why we're baptizing people today. When somebody goes under the waters of baptism, Romans chapter three says they share in the burial of Christ. When they come up out of the waters of baptism, the reason, all right, Redemption Church, I want you to go crazier for that moment than you do for a Seahawks touchdown. Okay, here's why. One of these events is a dude carrying an inflated piece of leather 
across a line. I go crazy for it too. But when somebody comes up out of the waters of baptism, what you're seeing is a reenactment of the resurrection of Jesus. That person is sharing in the resurrection of Jesus. And if you look at that testimony and you see my son among those who's baptized today, when he comes up out of the water, I want you to celebrate that accordingly. You're seeing a reenactment of the resurrection of Jesus. We now have, as believers, the Holy Spirit of God dwelling right here within us. And so things only got worse for Israel for about 2,000 years after that. The Romans sacked Jerusalem in the year 70. And while some Jewish people stayed in the land, the nation itself was dissolved. Their currency was gone. They had no military, no governmental structure. They became nomadic. They became a diaspora once more. And all that remained of the temple was one single section of wall called the Wailing Wall where even today tourists will go and write prayers on pieces of paper and scroll them up and stuff them into the walls. The reason that they wail is that they remember the words, the prophets, the descriptions, the grandiosity of the incredible temple that was once there. And today, a Muslim mosque, the Dome of the Rock, sits on the mounts that once was Solomon's temple. After this, 2,000 years would go by. And the people of Israel would be utterly scattered. And then it got worse. A megalomaniacal dictator trying to employ the ethics that he exegeted from origin of species killed six million Jews. And they stacked their skulls high. Now, this I do not know with any certainty. It's speculative on my part. This has not come from the word of God, but it's just plausible enough to make it worthy of a few seconds of sermon time to share with you. In Ezekiel chapter 37, God gives the prophet a vision of a valley full of dry bones. And that valley of bones rises up to come alive, a vast army. Now it's not interpretive liberty that causes me to say that's the nation of Israel. It's basic reading comprehension. As the Spirit would tell the prophet Ezekiel clearly, these bones are the whole house of Israel. God would cause them to come back to life and give them a home on their own land. And he said, I would do it so that you would know I am the Lord God and above me there is no other. Now here's where I speculate. It is plausible that the valley of dry bones that Ezekiel saw were the bones stacked at Auschwitz. It's possible that what he saw were the remains of Jewish people who had been mass murdered in a historically grotesque act of genocide. And if he looks at those bones and is asked by God, son of men, can these bones live? Ezekiel rightly says, God, you alone know. Well, then something happened. In World War II, the Allied forces advanced and the 101st Airborne Division's Easy Company came upon something. They didn't know what it was at first. They discovered the concentration camps. From here, as the Allied forces would gain victory, all of these refugees, these Jewish people who had been persecuted, who had survived the genocide, had nowhere to go. Because since the year 70, the Romans had sacked Jerusalem just as Jesus prophesied they would. And so they were put on a plot of land that was under the jurisdiction of Great Britain on a lease of sorts, if you will. But that lease was about to expire. The traditional name for this plot of land was Palestine. And here, Jewish people camped out near the Mount of Solomon's former temple, looked around and saw prophecy coming to fruition all around them. And they said, this is our land. This is what Ezekiel prophesied. This is what Isaiah prophesied. This is what Zechariah prophesied. This is what the prophets said would happen, that we would be put back on our own land. A leader named David Ben-Jurion, after whom the airport in Tel Aviv is named, rose up and led this group of Jewish people on the land that belonged to their forefathers 2,000 years prior to become a sovereign nation state. Chaos began to unfold in the Truman White House. He was a Democrat who believed the Bible. Yes, they exist. Truman's cabinet was deeply divided, not based on anti-Semitism, but based on true pragmatism. 
Why would you align the U.S. with this fledgling little nation state of refugees? They are utterly surrounded on every side. They're outgunned and outfunded. This would be the biggest PR disaster in American history if we choose the underdog and lose big. But Truman looked at his Bible and looked at what was happening. And he looked at what God's word said about those who bless Israel, how they will be blessed in return. And he said, we're going to align with them. And so on May 14th, 1948, the word was given to the press secretary to go out and to make a statement. The name Israel hadn't even been used yet, but the press secretary said that the United States hereby aligns itself with the sovereign nation state of Israel. Isaiah 66, 8 asks the question, how can it be? Is it possible that a nation could be born in a day? And this is how Israel comes back to life. On May 15th, 1948, the surrounding seven countries all declared war on Israel. It should have been a slaughter. Nine years later, Israel kicked all their tails. This doesn't happen. Nations don't come back into existence, especially not after a 2,000-year hiatus is anybody here concerned about the nation of Prussia coming back into existence? No, you're not. Why aren't you? List in your mind the reasons why you're not worried about Prussia coming back. And they've only been gone for a couple hundred years now. It's actually 10 times more likely that Prussia would come back than Israel would have come back. Well, they would need a government. They would need a military. They would need a currency. They would need infrastructure. Yeah. Miraculously, this outgunned, outnumbered, utterly surrounded nation is now one of the most powerful nations in the world. It's Israel. It's only ever happened with one nation. And there's only one book that prophesied all this would take place. The word of God. Why did God say he would do it? Certainly not because of Israel's good behavior. You, look, you like Ezekiel 37? Look at Ezekiel 36. God was taking them to task for their disobedience. It wasn't because they deserved it. God's favor is never deserved. It's just grace. He did it so that we would know he is the Lord God and above him there is no other. Historically, all of these pieces are put in place as the logistics of the book of Acts unfolds. There's no other book in the world that can describe history before it happens. Only the Bible does this. Only the word of God does this. When they ask, are you going to restore the political interests of Israel? Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? His response is, it's not for you to know. In fact, they probably wouldn't have liked it if he'd laid it out. Yeah, you got it. In 1948, they're like, what's a 1948? God had something much bigger in store, and it wasn't just about the political interests of Israel. Obviously, God loves his chosen nation of Israel. He favors his people. He has prophecies still to come about the nation of Israel. As the events of Revelation unfold, the very first people to know exactly what's going on are the rabbis who at first rejected the New Testament. And so God's not done with Israel, but the gospel is so much bigger than any one nation. So the next time some wackadoo comes out and says, I know the time and the hour that Jesus is coming back. So sell everything you own and follow me. Have some Kool-Aid. I will guarantee you that Jesus is not coming back on that time or that hour. Because Jesus said overtly and clearly, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. It's not for you to know. But you will receive power when my Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses right here in Jerusalem and then in Judea, truth be told, as we go through the book of Acts, you'll see it wasn't just because they were such good missionaries. In part, it's scattered throughout Judea because of persecution. And the very first enemies of the early church were other professing believers. The initial persecutors throughout the book of Acts, the people giving this fledgling newborn church a hard time, all professed belief in Yahweh. The Romans had no problem with the early church at first. The first persecutors of the church were other believers. And so they fled. But as they fled, they shared the gospel. And so the gospel goes throughout Judea. And then Samaria, there was huge cultural tension between Jews and Samaritans. 
The Samaritans really took their ancestry seriously. They took that altar that Abraham built quite seriously. So when Jesus gave the parable of the Good Samaritan, he was telling a story of radical cross-cultural reconciliation. It would be more akin to a confederate washing the feet of a Union soldier if it were told in American terms. It had huge cultural implications. Now, this is necessary because the Great Commission was to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them like we're doing today in the name of the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. That's why we have a plan to go through every book of God's inspired word together. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. So they're going to go to make disciples of every nation. They're going to have to go through Samaria. They're going to have to cross cultural lines. The book of Acts is not a book about racial reconciliation, but there are beautiful stories of racial reconciliation just happening as a symptom of the Holy Spirit's outpouring. Watch, watch. In chapter two, there are Jews from every nation all gathered together. They spoke every dialect of Hebrew and multiple languages. The work of the Tower of Babel to mitigate man's ability to collude in our shared depravity was mitigated by the Tower of Babel. This is also why the French Academy of Sciences bans the study of the ultimate origin of languages because it keeps taking everybody back to Genesis 6. This is where God confused man's speech, but this is where God lifted the language barrier. In Acts chapter 2, people began to share what they had seen And as they spoke, flames came from heaven. They not only spoke in a way that was understood, but they were able to understand. The gift of tongues served a very pragmatic purpose in its initial outpouring. It was to overcome the work of the Tower of Babel, to lift the language barrier. And as a result, salvation is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. They're departed from Jerusalem at Pentecost, this traditional feast observed after the Passover representatives to every synagogue, Messiah has come, and it's Yeshua of Nazareth. Then the Holy Spirit pours out again in Acts chapter 10, what we're going to preach next week. And they speak in tongues in Acts chapter 10, even though they already spoke the same language. So why do they speak in tongues if they already spoke the same language? Come back next week and find out. There are multiple outpourings of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. The two most prominent uses of the gift of tongues were Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 2, it was to overcome the language barrier. In Acts chapter 10, we'll talk about that next week. But I want to show you one passage that comes in the penultimate text right before what we're covering in our curriculum. It's available at redemptionwashington.com. It's a beautiful word as we see the diaconate born to protect the church along ethnic lines to see to it that the Hebraic widows were not getting favoritism at the distribution of food over the Hellenistic widows. As you see Philip bring the gospel to an Ethiopian official who then takes it back to Candace, not her name, her title, more like Pharaoh. As you see the gospel begin to bring people from every culture together around something beautiful. What more beautiful thing could you have in common than that which saves your soul? This is happening all over the book of Acts. We see Peter rise up, lead the church. We see people come and bring an offering to the church under false pretense and drop dead. And that's the New Testament, by the way. God has not lost any of his wrath for sin. Do not mistake grace for license. Rather, the atoning work of Jesus on the cross is just that significant. So as the first martyrdom takes place in chapter 7, A man named Stephen is being stoned to death. And he says something that I think carries tremendous soteriological significance in the debate about Arminianism and Calvinism. He says to them, you and your forefathers are always resisting the Holy Spirit. And then he prays for the people who throw the stones that extinguish his life. And he gets a standing ovation from Jesus as he is by the Father's right hand. There's a man there, Saul of Tarsus, student of Gamaliel, the most renowned rabbi of his day. Gamaliel was taught by Hillel. If you go to a public university and you see the Jewish student union, it'll be called the Hillel Center, named after Hillel, who taught Gamaliel, who taught Saul of Tarsus in the book of Acts. 
Saul of Tarsus was there lending his pharisaical authority and approval to the public execution of Stephen. And people were laying their coats at his feet as a gesture of respect. And then that Saul of Tarsus, with full authority to arrest anybody who proclaimed to be a follower of the way, that's what they called us before in the Pisidian city of Antioch, they called us Christians, a pejorative term meaning little Christs. We were followers of the way, and Saul had full authority to arrest anyone and take them to Jerusalem. He was breathing out murderous threats against us. And then he meets Jesus, and everything changes. Saul is the perfect instrument to personify the apex between the covenants old and new. Because he was by pedigree and education and background and qualifications, the ultimate Jew. Like on a scale from one to Jewish, he was Saul of Tarsus. And God chose him to reach the Gentiles. That's a huge deal. You want to talk about cultural reconciliation? Jews woke up every morning and thanked God that they weren't Gentiles. If they bumped into a Gentile on the street, they'd have to go home and change their clothes and become ceremonially clean all over again. And God told the most authoritative and well-educated Jew in the land, you are going to preach my gospel to the Gentiles. And this is where we pick up in the book of Acts. So just before the miraculous resurrection testimonies you're going to study in your small groups this weekend. There's this seemingly insignificant logistical detail that's everything. It's in Acts chapter 9, verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, right? Did you see, did you catch that? What did Jesus prophesy in Acts 1 at? You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. By chapter nine, the prophecy is already coming true. The church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Live in the fear of the Lord. He and he alone by his word is able to predict and declare what's gonna happen. And you're gonna watch the book of Acts trace perfectly the origins of our Christianity. You're going to see it foretell things before they happen. You're going to see the book of Acts give exactly what Luke intended as an evidentialist proof to Theophilus, multiple convincing proofs of the veracity of the claims of Scripture. But at the core of it all is the Holy Spirit. At the core of it all is the Holy Spirit. You live in the fear of the Lord, and the church grew in number. Today, we're baptizing 13 people. Live in the fear of the Lord, and the same Holy Spirit that brought the gospel from Jerusalem, throughout Judea, to Samaria, all the way to the ends of the earth, has lost none of his potency. And the same Holy Spirit that broke history in half is in this church. This is the book of Acts, this room. Historical books tell us what happened. Prophetic books tell us what will happen. The book of Acts tells us what is happening. You, Redemption Church, you are the latest chapter in a long line of legacies of congregations filled with this exact same history-breaking Holy Spirit of God. And if you, my skeptical friend, have been swayed in any degree by these convincing proofs, even in survey form, typically I preach through a large portion of text. Today, what I've just given is a survey of 10 chapters. But if the Holy Spirit of God described in these words is let from the pages to grip you by the soul, I can think of no better way to apply our lives to this text than for you to become the latest Christian in this long line of legacy. If you, by that same Holy Spirit, today confess that Jesus is Lord, then you are the latest installment in God's beautiful story of grace. And if you as a Christian 
have not been living a spirit-filled life and you want to know what that means, or if you come from a background that tells you necessarily to be baptized in the Holy Spirit is to speak in tongues, I want to invite you into the text of Acts. I want you to see what it looks like to live a Holy Spirit-filled life. And I want you to measure the gap between your status quo and what this book says church should be. The reason I've chosen Acts to follow the Gospels is that as we go from John to Acts to apologetics and then evangelism training and then the doctrine of baptism, we will have seen not only the full testimony of the Gospel of John, but we will have seen a demonstration of the Spirit's power in the book of Acts. I want you to see what the Holy Spirit of God is capable of. And then we will evangelize without fear. So would you stand? Would you pray with me, my skeptical friend? And if you're a Christian who needs prayer for absolutely anything at all, would you come forward? If you need to be baptized today, would you come forward? Let's pray. God, I pray on behalf of my skeptical friend who's who's now taken with the very convincing proofs that Luke presented originally to Theophilus. It may as well have been written to us today, God. I didn't know your word contained promises of things that would happen before they happened. I didn't know, I didn't know that your spirit's legacy in the book of Acts transcends the histories of nations. I didn't know, God, that you're the one who makes nations rise and fall. I didn't know that your spirit is the one who caused the gospel to transcend the language barrier. I didn't know. But Lord, I believe these words are true today. I believe what you said is true, that your church would receive power by the Holy Spirit of God. They were your witnesses in Jerusalem and then across Judea and then across cultural lines and then all the way to the other side of the earth in Washington State before Washington State even existed. And now hear this same ancient gospel as true as ever, as powerful as ever, the Holy Spirit as potent as ever is drawing on my heart. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Redemption Church, would you say Jesus is Lord? Say it, Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. I believe this gospel. I believe it all, Jesus. I believe it all, Jesus. I am the latest recipient, a long genealogy of grace recipients. I believe you, Jesus. Your gospel has made its way from Jerusalem, through Judea, across Samaria, all the way around the earth, across two millennia, to God with my heart today. I believe you, Jesus. I am saved. I am saved. I am saved. In your name we pray. Amen. You come forward. Let's worship.